the internet has changed the way business buyers behave and naturally the way business sellers behave. And, and you know, the power of YouTube and TikTok combined have really driven the acceptance of video as a marketing communications tool. The internet allows much more variety in terms of sound, graphics, motion, music even. So, as I said, there's nothing more efficient in the B2B marketing toolkit than a face-to-face -face event. Yes. Where you can look someone in the eye and really have a conversation. And welcome to the Growth Genius Series brought to you by DMA Asia and InfiDigit. My name is Shelley and I'm the Country Director Americas at InfiDigit. I'm also the co-founder and director at DMA Asia. In this Growth Genius Series, the world's best marketeers and business leaders are interviewed about the brands they have worked on, the successful campaign strategies, how they got noticed by their customers and how they delivered better customer experiences to drive growth. Today, we have a special guest, Ruth Stevens, President eMarketing Strategy. Ruth Stevens consults on customer acquisition and retention, specializing in B2B markets. She advises companies on go-to-market strategy, sales lead generation, customer and prospect data, content marketing, and account-based marketing. Crane's B2B magazine named Ruth one of the 100 most influential people in business marketing. Ruth also teaches marketing up at business schools in the US and abroad. She co-hosts the Marketing Horizon podcast. Her new book is B2B Data Driven Marketing, Sources, Uses, Results. A very warm welcome, Ruth. Thank you, Shelley. Sure appreciate the chance to chat with you today. Great. So Ruth, you have been working in B2B for many years. How did you get into this field? Well, I started my career at Book of the Month Club in customer acquisition for special interest book clubs. And after seven years at Time Warner, which was the parent company, I had an offer to move over to another publishing company called Ziff Davis. And there I was asked to generate sales leads for subscribers to, you're not going to believe this, a subscription product, CD-ROMs. Okay. <laughs> Remember? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. That were sent out once a month, filled with information called from the Ziff Davis computer magazines. Wow. And I just loved it from the first day there and learned B2B marketing from the ground up, but I was originally using the same database marketing techniques that I had learned at Time Warner. So it was a pretty seamless transition for me. And after that, I went to IBM, which was sort of the big time in B2B marketing and learned even more there. So when I went out on my own later, about 20 years ago, I decided to specialize in B2B marketing uh, as a way to differentiate myself as a consultant. Yes, that's wonderful. I guess you have seen a lot of changes over years. What's going on in B2B marketing today? It's changing really fast as a result of a couple of drivers. Mostly the internet has changed the way business buyers behave and naturally the way business sellers behave. And there's a, a lot going on. Um, COVID kind of accelerated those changes. For example, you know, the business conference and trade show world, which has long been a very big part of the B2B marketing yeah. portfolio, yeah. was upended yeah. as, as we know. And people have adapted to virtual events, I think remarkably well to the point where even though we're starting to reconvene in person, it's clear that virtual versions of an in-person event plus virtual only events have a place 
in the in the marketing toolkit. So that's kind of additive and and welcome as a result. I'm seeing that uh, there's a, a trend around what people are calling humanizing B2B. Yes. Meaning that our old way of thinking that business buyers are buying on behalf of their companies and they need a lot of data and a lot of ammunition to justify their purchase decisions and lots of parties are involved in the in the buying of a b2b product or service but at the same time the humanity of the actual buyers and you know they're buying on behalf of their companies but they're still people and also that's in parallel with the fact that brands b2b and brands even boring industrial brands and scientific um, highly technical brands are realizing that making their own brand more human and accessible and authentically positioned in the minds of the buyers is helpful. So marketers are putting their attention to that imperative and it, it's really paying off. Another interesting thing that's caught my attention, which is maybe a minor matter, but it's about video as a media mm -hmm. channel. And, you know, the power of YouTube and TikTok combined have really driven the acceptance of video as a marketing communications tool in all walks of life, even technical topics and um, industrial topics. So we're seeing clever b2b marketers apply video at all stages of the buying and selling process and it's really exciting it, it can be highly technical in messaging but it can also be fun and engaging and of course we know that compared to print the internet allows much more variety in terms of sound graphics motion music even so Video is a, a medium that is, is really taking off now in B2B. Uh, those are a couple of interesting trends. Mm -hmm. So what we see that the younger generation today don't like to speak on the phone and prefer emails or messaging with their uh, potential customers. So are we facing the death of the traditional salesperson? This is really a subject of great conversation in the B2B world right now because salespeople have for many years now been losing, you know, some people say losing control of the, the buyer who is of course researching online. And this means that we marketers are stepping in to satisfy those researchers and make sure that our solutions are findable, that we're being helpful, educational, we're not being overly promotional, but we're helping them solve their problems. And the salespeople have, their role in the buying process has been reduced in a way because they're often most productive at the tail end of the journey or the process that the buyers go through to the point where some observers are saying as much as 85% of the buying process is accomplished before a salesperson is ever even brought into the conversation. Now that's not going to be true everywhere, but it's definitely a direction. And another corollary is that B2B buyers in some respects are getting more and more comfortable conducting transactions online, meaning e-commerce. Mm -hmm. At least pieces of the buying process are there and are, are enabled by e-commerce today. It's always been a sales tool for very simple products like, you know, office managers will buy office supplies, toner and paper and so forth through e-commerce, no problem. But when it comes to a complex solution, they really want to talk to a salesperson. So the current thinking is that a sales professionals involvement will still be required 
into the long future. And also the availability of, of technical salespeople to help the buyers make a decision and get whatever product or service they're buying installed and working in their labs or in their IT departments or wherever it is. There's an argument to be made that it's a career that is not going to need as many human resources as it used to. Wow. That's very good also and bad also, right? <laughs> so yeah. yeah. In a way. Hey, I, I do argue though that people buy from people and they, they buy from people that they like and respect. So realistically speaking, it's unlikely that a large enterprise is going to make a multi-million dollar purchase decision without talking face to face with a, a representative of the supplier firm. So what happened to the relationship building then? Because in B2B, it's very important to build relations, right? It is, and that's where this trusted relationship really plays a role in the, and why business sellers have long been really focused on that, you know, with entertainment and getting to know you and a great salesperson will spend most of his time his or her time building a relationship through golf and dinners and you know trips and so forth knowing the names of the family members and yes. all that at the same time the relationship is still important mm -hmm. it, it's 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 different and interesting for me as a marketer is to watch how the marketing is getting more human in kind of stepping into that gap where our marketing communications need to fill in mm -hmm. where the salesperson is not involved. Mm -hmm. We have to pick up that piece of the process and, and build that trust using other methods. And that's why interactive tools, social media, chat bots, video, and these more human messaging um, channels are a bigger and bigger part of the B2B toolkit. Mm -hmm. So my next question is that, what is the most effective channel for B2B marketing? Do you think that <laughs> SEO can play a yeah. very important role in generating quality leads? Mm, yes, indeed. Well, lead gen is always job one for a marketing department in B2B. It's probably going to be that way forever. Although the changes in the buying process and the buying behavior overall, getting us to the point where marketing has a much bigger portfolio to attend to. It's less of a marketing generates a lead and tosses it over the transom to the salesperson who then follows up. Marketing is actually involved earlier and deeper in the relationship now. The channel, there is no single channel that is a standout, but if you asked me what are the must-have channels in B2B, I would still begin with the website and make sure that our company website serves the needs of our target audience. It provides information that helps them solve their problems, helps them recognize us as a trusted helper and a reliable partner. It also needs to be interactive so that it's not just what they call brochure wear. <laughs> it engages them. This is why chatbots, especially the modern ones that allow a lot of functionality to convert a visitor to a data element or a data point, for example. I wouldn't call it a lead yet, but definitely want to have tools that de-anonymize the website visitor. One of these, of course, is looking at the IP address of the visitor and making note that a certain account has visited the, the site, assuming they're coming from their corporate browser. And one way to, the, the most effective way to de-anonymize is to make an offer. Uh, this is Direct Marketing 101. Usually it's a piece of irresistibly important and useful content that in exchange for filling out a web form, the visitor will download the content and 
we get the name and the contact information and the visitor gets the valuable piece of content. But also, as I said, IP address identification, also using chatbots and other tools to try to make the website interactive and highly searchable. Um, many industries are have a lot of complex information to provide to buyers. And if the search engine on the website is inadequate, that will frustrate visitors. But so the website is like the basic owned medium of the seller. But these days, interestingly, social media are more important than ever, especially as the buyers are younger and younger and entering the buying circle in at the, the customer end from the position of being digital natives, unlike people of my age who, you know, arrived at the internet later in life. It's imperative for B2B marketers to recognize that even though we think of social media as mostly social and not business other than LinkedIn, that this is where our customers are and our prospects, so we have to be there. And then once those two are covered, then search engine optimization and, and search engine marketing would be where I would focus in digital terms. Now, <laughs> B2B events though, have always been a big part of the mix. And now that in-person events are coming back, that's another area that I would not neglect because it allows the relationship to be developed so much faster in a face-to-face -face environment, like an event that you kind of leapfrog over probably months, maybe even years of what it would take in digital channels to establish. So that's, I'm, so I'm ducking your single most important question <laughs> and giving you a whole yeah, plethora yeah. of them. Yeah, no, no problem. So this brings to my next question. How can B2B brands stand out on social media? Because I used to reach out to my target audience through LinkedIn, which used to work so well, but now I'm seeing low response and I'm getting this feedback that LinkedIn is becoming almost spammy. Uh, and the pandemic has massively escalated this. So what are your views on this? How can B2B marketers go beyond LinkedIn? Hmm. Well, in the social media kind of context, LinkedIn is still the single most valuable for many reasons. The marketing solutions available at LinkedIn, like in mail and the ability to reach out to highly targeted prospects based on keywords is it just can't be ignored, even if response rates are, are declining. By the way, Shelley, are you also noticing that LinkedIn kind of automated B2B LinkedIn management and lead gen services are proliferating all over the place? Yes. I feel yes. like I, I get an offer every day from somebody. That's the reason people are not checking their yeah. inbox. You know, they're not going on yeah. to check me. This yeah, year, they, there's been another sales pitch and then, you know, and, and they know that it's all automated. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is. It is frustrating. And I'm sure the people at LinkedIn are concerned about this and trying to figure out how to yeah. increase the or recover the that quality of the experience. But as I said, other than LinkedIn, I argue that just about every social medium is worthy of our inspection. Yeah, in fact, the, Instagram is also mm, doing pretty well. Or, Instagram, TikTok, yeah. It's yeah. it's remarkable how our buyers are there and we've got to be there too, even if we're selling pretty technical solutions or what you might think are boring, like accounting services and so forth. If our customers are there, we've got to be there too. Yes, so, that's, that's right. Um, I see this new way of B2B marketers getting on TikTok. And it, it's really wonderful that how they are harnessing the power of TikTok as well. Yeah, it's sort of hilarious, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. 
and it's part of what I was mentioning about video that you know the two are just uh, feeding off of each other. Yeah, yeah. So, Do you have some favorite campaign examples that you can share with us? Anything from your book or anything you have done or you admire done by somebody else? Sure. Matter of fact, I I went went over to the bookshelf and brought out a, a copy of my my most recent book, which oh, I know wow. with the blur is maybe a little difficult to see, but this book on B two B data driven marketing, which was co authored with Theresa Kushner, uh, contains a, about a dozen case studies, and one of my favorites is the first in in the chapter on case studies from a, a story in actually around 2004 to 2008 it was a period of um, great change in the world of industrial machinery and i i happened to get acquainted with the u.s division of a very well-known japanese manufacturer of machine tools now not everybody knows what a machine tool is, so let me just explain it. Machine tools are, are intended to cut metal into precise shapes. So the big industries that use machine tools, at least high-end machine tools like this one, from this company called um, Makino or Makino, the companies that are the, the biggest users of machine tools are no surprise companies that use a lot of metal in their manufacturing processes. So one would be automotive, of course, and the other being aerospace. And then there are, there are lots of smaller companies that use machine tools like uh, manufacturers of molds and dyes. Um, and Makino being the producer of the most sophisticated premium, high-end, and high-priced, relatively, machine tools, reflective of the Japanese reputation for technical superiority and good quality, has a very large division in the U.S. calling on automotive and aerospace manufacturers, you know, so it's like Ford and Boeing, you could, or General Motors and Boeing, you could think about it. And their traditional go-to-market process, they had about 125 salespeople and about another 100 um, agency, you know, reps or agents um, on the ground representing them. And they would support these this sales force tr with traditional B2B marketing tools, namely advertising and trade publications like aerospace weekly or whatever the pubs in those industries and trade shows they were exhibiting at around 30 trade shows a year so they were everywhere getting their technology in front of buyers in in these two industries and in early 2000s they realized that the market was changing and that they needed it to change with it and they realized that there was a lot of waste because the entire industry of machine tooling represents about 55,000 companies. But most of them, the vast bulk, like more than 70% of them are mom and pop tiny shops. Like if you go over to Queens and you, you know, in the industrial area of Queens, you'll see millions of them, well not millions, but many, mom and pop machine tooling shops, that's not the customer for Makino. They're really enterprise premium uh, sellers. So they realized that by uh, advertising and trade show exhibiting, they were marketing to all 55,000 and they really needed to focus more clearly on the maybe 15,000 or so that would really ever be their prospective buyers. So they decided to build a marketing database. Ta-da, doesn't this make you happy, Shelly? <laughs> they said, we've got to be more laser focused on our targets. So they built a database with a number of inputs. They actually bought 
data from the same trade pubs that they had been advertised, advertising in. They had their own CRM system, meaning a Salesforce automation tool. They also used government documents, where, you know, many industrial manufacturing products are registered with the federal government for safety and other reasons. Mm -hmm. So it's publicly available data on installations of machines mm -hmm. in, in, in manufacturing. And they also went around to all their salespeople and said, who do you want to see? Who's your target customer? Wow. Who do you want in there? And then ended up with several thousand. Oh, they also had a magazine. So the subscribers to, the, to that magazine. So little by little, they built this marketing database and had it then populated using database services companies with the names of the various individual contacts in those accounts that the salespeople and marketing people wanted to talk to. So these would be like factory people and finance people and other titles. So that was one piece. And then the other thing they did was they invested in content marketing. They were early adopters of the webinar Hmm. realizing that as the premium vendor of machine tools, their engineers were the best in the world. Yeah. And so they asked their engineers to kind of get on a webinar and talk about the latest machine tooling techniques, turn those into webinars. They were in the beginning producing as many as three a month and posting them on the website. By the way, all of that content was uh, gated by a web form. So if you wanted it, you had to give up your contact information. But mo to me, the most interesting angle of this whole story is that they decided to build a presence on Facebook. Now, I first heard this and I said, what? Facebook is cat videos and grandmothers. Makes no sense at all. But as yeah. a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, it turned out to be a huge success. And very rapidly, just in a matter of years, all of those webinars um, were being downloaded uh, from Facebook. Well, they would be promoted on Facebook and then to view it, you had to fill out the web form at the site. But they eventually had 100,000 followers. Wow. Facebook and became known as an enormous source of machine tooling education to the point where in the professional schools, like the engineering schools, Rensselaer, the Polytech, all these important places where engineers were learning about machining and other applications for tools like this, the professors would recommend that if you want to learn about machining go to the Makino Facebook page. <laughs> so that's great. You know, this is 15 years ago that they were really ahead of the curve. So I love that story. Do we have time for one other? Yeah, sure. We we have time. We have all the time. <laughs> okay. So another story I like comes from Marketing Sherpa, which is a, a terrific resource for case studies mostly in B2B and this one was about a very small plastic injection molding manufacturer called the Radon Group. And the Radon, you know, th this is a small business. Okay. And they were serving small businesses, unlike Makino, which is more of an enterprise situation. But um, the Radon Group, it was a long standing family owned company from the, founded in the 50s. And they were getting creamed by competition from China. And so if a, like a toy maker needs to buy a bunch of parts to assemble into the toy, they would hire injection molds to be made so that they could manufacture the pieces of the toy mm -hmm. and then have them assembled in China. Okay. And so little by little, the toy manufacturers were saying, well, I don't want to produce piece of my 
intended toy here in the U.S. and then ship it to China, where it's going to be assembled and then shipped back, I'll just use, you know, China is so efficient, I'll just have all my toy pieces manufactured over in China. And so um, the Rodon group was, was losing business. This was in 2013 that this case study was written. And they were understandably under a lot of pressure and realized that they that their customers perceived that China was more efficient and cheaper manufacturing than theirs mm -hmm. and that you know this was true in all US manufacturing environments and so they decided to meet the problem head on and they came up with a slogan a tagline for their company cheaper than china wow <laughs> cheaper than china and just three words very clear and you know attacking the, the problem right away straightforward so they adjusted their website all their social media all their messaging featured this cheaper than china message and even to the point where I was told that some Chinese manufacturers called in to say, wait, how come you're cheaper than us? <laughs> so the, and the case study on, on Sherpa reveals that within a couple of years, about, about three years, their, their sales had not only had stemmed the de decline, they had actually increased by 33% and they had, um, dramatically increased like 400% their website traffic and website visits. So um, yeah, I, I, I thought it's really a branding story versus a, a sales lead generation story like the Makino one, but yeah, um, yeah. I, I thought it was instructive. Yeah, very interesting story, very interesting. So this brings to my next question, any insights into where B2B marketing is headed and how does the uh, future of B2B marketing looks like. Yeah, I like to quote my friend Bernice Grossman, whom I know you know, yeah. who yeah. always who would always say, "My crystal ball is on <laughs> back order." <laughs> I don't have I don't have access to my crystal ball right now. Yeah. So yeah. even you know going out on a limb and making some predictions about where things are going, I I would bring up again what I've already mentioned, which is the change in business buying behavior. I think it's going to continue to change as the buyers get younger and younger. Well, they won't necessarily be younger, but the young people today will be entering the buying circle in these companies at a higher percentage over the next several years. And they bring different behaviors. I'll tell you, I was teaching B2B marketing in Argentina recently with Mary Tehan and uh, I was astonished to hear several students say well I don't even visit company websites anymore when I'm searching around to buy something I I just I rely on social media mm. so they were saying in so many words that they personally buy differently from the way we do um, and similarly with especially this was accelerated by COVID, the ease of e-commerce is going to change the way buying is done. And also companies are seeking to reduce their risk even more. So they're making the buying groups even bigger. Mm -hmm. On average, these buying groups are getting up into the 20s. Wow. In terms of the number of people involved in making a decision. No salesperson can have a personal relationship with 20 people hmm. uh, the way a salesperson could 20 years ago have a relationship with two or three. It's, mm -hmm. So marketing has to step in and, and try to manage that relationship. So that's one thing. Another is that, uh, and I've also mentioned this earlier, that the, the role of sales and the role of marketing is changing and will continue to change that the funnel where, you know, the marketers kind of throw a lead into the top of the funnel and then the salespeople move it down the funnel is changing. And 
really sales and marketing needs to rethink how they operate together mm -hmm. and go to market together and divide up the work together. Mm -hmm. And there's some good examples out there now of companies that have done that successfully. And then the, the last trend I would point out is the return of events. And as I said, there's nothing more efficient in the B2B marketing toolkit than a face-to-face -face event. Yes. Where you can look someone in the eye and really have a conversation. So even though it's the highest cost per touch or cost per contact of any B2B marketing channel, it's also the most effective on an ROI basis. So I predict that a combination of in-person and hybrid events is, is going to continue to be massively important part of the B2B budget and the toolkit. Mm -hmm. So about, you know, hosting dinners and events, we do, we also do that a, a lot, but uh, sometimes it's very frustrating because people are busy and uh, there are last minute cancellations and, you know, all the effort and the money goes wasted. So do you still think that, uh, uh, is it worth hosting dinners and events and event inviting potential customers? <laughs> My suggestion is that you switch to breakfast events. Okay. That's and yeah. the, you know, there are two reasons for that. Yeah. One is yeah. that the cost of a breakfast customer or client is much cheaper. Mm -hmm. So your risk, even if people have no-shows, your cost per no-show is much lower. Yes. But the other thing is that breakfast conversations, people are brighter in the morning and there's no alcohol involved. So you can have really substantive conversations at breakfast. People are fresher. Yeah. So I, yeah. that, that, that's, that's a good idea. That's mean. why we have switched to now breakfast briefings. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. So what are some of the recommendations you give to B2B marketers today? Ah, uh, well, I've got a couple of kind of pet peeves about B2B marketing and some of the areas where we need to improve it. One is about the customer information or the data that we collect about customers and prospects. You know, in consumer, it's usually not worthwhile to collect prospect data, but in B2B it usually is, at least to a certain extent. But I, I see over and over again that B2B marketers delegate responsibility for the actual data itself to somebody in marketing operations or revenue operations or somewhere and say, oh, well, you know, Mary's managing our database and she's in charge of that. And I think that's wrong. Um, I, I suggest that marketers become intimately knowledgeable about what's in their marketing database. Take a look at two or three customer records, recognize what's there, what's not there, what's correct, what's incorrect, based on what you already know about the account and make it your personal mission to keep the data accurate and um, complete. And it's not easy, <laughs> but it, sh it is so valuable and important to have correct and complete information that we just can't afford to ignore it or de delegate it to a third party. So that's one thing. I'm always out there harassing people on this subject. <laughs> then another area that is a big source of discontent at my end is the relative uh, attention we pay to current customer marketing versus net new customers. And, you know, it's understandable when salespeople are saying, leads, I need leads. Um, and every report you see on the B2B industry is says that sales quantity and quality is job one for a marketing department. But as the buying process changes and the scope of the marketing portfolio broadens, we're being pushed, you know, kind of kicking and screaming into helping to manage accounts 
this used to be delegated to an account manager you know, who had responsibility for expanding, penetrating existing accounts. Sometimes they're now called customer success managers, although I'm still not really clear on what the difference is. But marketing can do so much to enhance that relationship, broaden, deepen the penetration into the account, identify opportunities, nurture those relationships that we need to step up and take responsibility for retention marketing as much as we do for new customer acquisition. And by the way, Crane's B2B marketing was still being published. It's sadly no longer published today. Every year they would do a survey asking B2B marketers, what percentage of your budget goes to acquisition versus retention. And every year it was the yeah. same number. It was about 85% acquisition and about 15% retention. Mm -hmm. Changed maybe one percentage point. And I think it's still true today to my great, my great regret. Mm -hmm. And then the last recommendation I would make which I already mentioned is to focus on social media. I'm, I'm seeing data this year for the first time that suggests that social media is pulling ahead of email and the corporate website as the most important media channel in B2B, something I never thought would happen, but it's happening. So we need to jump on that and, and be active. Hmm. So, Thank you, Shelley. I hope some of these ideas will be helpful to your listeners. Sure. So this brings to our last segment. So tell us one passion you follow and how it helps to elevate your profession. <laughs> we ask everybody this question. Do you? Gosh, I don't know. Passion. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not as noble as probably your, your other guests. Um, so, you know, I'm not trying to change the world or feed the children or whatever. But I, thinking about my own preferences and my nature, I've known really since I was a, a young girl that I was as extroverted as my mother was. <laughs> Just a totally outgoing person. And I have used that to my advantage as a business person because I tend to it just comes naturally to me to get to know people and to stay in touch with them. And I've, thanks to LinkedIn, I've managed to convert that into a pretty powerful network. I treat with great respect and, and care. But I also, I say this to my students that we must play to our strengths. Maybe you're familiar with the great Marcus Buckingham who has a book and a whole institute by that name, play to your strengths, because if we're pulling ourselves away from our natural inclinations every day, life is just not as much fun. <laughs> and, and most of us have some strengths that are really worthwhile. So I say, do that. In my case, I will gladly go to a networking event and meet new people and build my, my relationships because it comes easily to me but for people who are naturally introverts yeah. then yeah. then build your business based on other strengths that, that you have be my recommendation that's great so where can our viewers uh, find you connect with you and how can they buy your books oh thanks well of course i'm on linkedin as ruth stevens and my website is ruthstevens.com and my books are all available on Amazon, no mm -hmm. surprise. Okay. Uh, I have a not only this data-driven marketing book co-authored with Theresa, but I have two other books I've written, one called Maximizing Lead Generation and one called Trade Show and Event Marketing. So thanks for allowing me to promote my books. Yes, definitely. I'm sure that everybody will find uh, your books very useful. In fact, I found uh, this session very useful. I learned a lot being a B2B marketer myself. So thank you so much, Ruth, for your time today. 
to our viewers if you have any follow up questions please comment below uh, we would love to have your feedback and uh, we will see you soon with another insightful session till then peace thank you ruth thank you shelly